everyone, Miss Amy here. Welcome to the To Be Continued Book Club. We're going to read a little bit of a book called The Field Guide. This book is part of a series called The Spider Wit Chronicles. And this book was written by Tony DiTrelisi and Holly Black. All right, let's see. All right, there's a let a handwritten letter right there. Let's see what it says. Dear Mrs. Black and Mr. DiTrelisi, the authors, I know that a lot of people don't believe in fairies, but I do, and I think that you do too. After I read your books, I told my brothers about you, and we decided to write. We know about real fairies. In fact, we know a lot about them. The page attached to this one is a photocopy from an old book we found in our attic. It isn't a great copy because we had some trouble with the photocopier. The book tells people how to identify fairies and how to protect themselves. Can you please give this book to your publisher? If you can, please put a letter in this envelope and give it back to the store. We will find a way to send the book. The normal mail is too dangerous. We just want people to know about this. The stuff that has happened to us could happen to anyone. Sincerely, Mallory, Jared, and Simon Grace. Oh, but it says the page attached is not included. And it says map of the Spiderwick estate and surrounding areas. Here's a map. It's pretty neat. Here's a picture of a big old house, and it says it was more like a dozen shacks. Chapter 1, in which the Grace children get acquainted with their new home. If someone had asked Jared Grace what jobs his brother and sister would have when they grew up, he would have no trouble replying. He would have said that his brother, Simon, would be either a veterinarian or a lion tamer. He would have said that his sister, Mallory, would, have either, be, would either be an Olympic fencer or in jail for stabbing someone with a sword. But he couldn't say what job he would grow up to have. Not that anyone had asked him. Not that anyone asked his opinion on anything at all. Here's a picture. Jared Grace. And the other one is Simon Grace. The new house, for instance, Jared Grace looked up at it and squinted. Maybe it would look better blurry. It's a shack, Mallory said getting out of the station wagon. It wasn't really, though. It was more like a dozen shacks had been piled on top of one another. There were several chimneys, and the whole thing was topped off by a strip of iron fence sitting on the roof like a particularly garish hat. It's not so bad, their mother said, with a smile that looked only slightly forced. It's Victorian. Simon, Jared's identical twin, didn't look upset. He was probably thinking of all the animals he could have now. Actually, considering what he had packed into their tiny bedroom in New York, Jared figured it would take a lot of rabbits and hedgehogs and whatever else was out here to satisfy Simon. Come on, Jared, Simon called. Jared realized that they all, they had all crossed to the front steps and he was alone on the lawn, staring at the house. The 
doors were faded gray, worn with age. The only traces of paint were an interminate cream stuck deep in crevices and around the hinges. A rusted ram's head door knocker hung from a single heavy nail at its center. Their mother fit a jagged key into the lock, turned it and shoved hard with her shoulder. The door opened into a dim hallway. The only window was halfway up the stairs and its stained glass panes gave the walls an eerie reddish glow. I just, it's just like I remembered, she said smiling. Only dustier, said Mallory. Their mother sighed, but didn't otherwise respond. The hallway led into the dining room. A long table with faded water spots was the only piece of furniture. The plaster ceiling was cracked in places and a chandelier hung from frayed wires. Why don't you three start bringing in things from the car, their mother said. Into here, Jared asked. Yes, into here, their mother put down her suitcase on the table, ignoring the eruption of dust. If your great Aunt Lucinda hadn't given us a place to stay, I don't know where we would have gone. We should be grateful. None of them said anything. Try as she, he might, Jared didn't feel anything close to grateful. Ever since their dad had moved out, everything had gone bad. He'd messed up at school and the fading bruise over his left eye wouldn't let him forget it. But this place, this place was the worst yet. Jared, his mother said, as he turned to follow Simon out to unload the car. What? His mother waited until the other two were down the hall before she spoke. This is a chance to start over for all of us, okay? Jared nodded grudgingly. He didn't need her to say the rest of it. That the only reason he hadn't got kicked out of school was because they were moving away anyway. Another reason he was supposed to be grateful, only he wasn't. Outside, Mallory stacked two suitcases on top of a steamer trunk. I heard she's starving herself to death. Aunt Lucinda? She's just old, said Simon. Old and crazy. But Mallory shook her head. I heard Mom on the phone. She was telling Uncle Terrence that Aunt Lucy thinks little men bring her food. What do you expect? She's in a nut house, Jared said. Mallory went on like she hadn't heard him. She told the doctors the food she got was better than anything they'd ever taste. You're making that up. Simon crawled in the back seat and opened up one of the suitcases. Mallory shrugged. If she dies, this place is going to get inherited by someone and we're gonna have to move again. Well, maybe we can go back to the city, Jared said. Fat chance, said Simon. He took out a wad of tube socks. Oh no, Jeffrey and Lemon Drop chewed their way loose. Mom told you not to bring the mice, Mallory said. She said you could have normal animals now. If I let them go, they'd get stuck in a glue trap or something, said Simon, turning a sock inside out, one finger sticking out of a hole. Besides, you brought all your fencing junk. It's not junk, Mallory growled, and it's not alive. Shut up. Jared took a step towards his sister. Just because you've got one black eye doesn't mean I can't give you another. Mallory flipped her ponytail 
As she turned, turned towards him, she shoved a heavy suitcase into his hands. Go ahead and carry that if you're so tough. Even though Jared knew he might be bigger and stronger than her someday, when she wasn't 13 and he wasn't nine, it was hard to picture. Jared managed to lug the suitcase inside the door before he dropped it. He figured he could drag it the rest of the way if he had to, and no one would be the wiser. Alone in the hallway of the house, however, Jared no longer remembered how to get to the dining room. Two different hallways split off from this one, winding deep into the middle of the house. Mom? Although he'd meant to call out softly, his voice sounded very soft, even to him. No answer. Mom? He took a tentative step and then another until the creak of a board under his feet stopped him. Just as he paused, something inside the wall rustled. He could hear it scrabbling upward until the sound disappeared past the ceiling. His heart beat against his chest. It's probably just a squirrel, he told himself. After all, the house looked like it was falling apart. Anything could be living inside. They'd be lucky if there wasn't a bear in the basement and birds in all the heating ducts. That was, if the place even had heat. Mom, he said again, even more faintly. Then the door behind him opened and Simon came in carrying mason jars with two bug-eyed gray mice in them. Mallory was right behind him scowling. I heard something, Jared said, in the wall. What? Simon asked. I don't know. Jared didn't want to admit. For a moment, he thought it was a ghost, probably a squirrel. Simon looked at the wall with interest. Brocaded gold wallpaper hung limply, peeling and pocketing in places. You think so? In the house? I've always wanted a squirrel. No one seemed to think that something in the walls was anything to worry about. So Jared didn't say anything more about it. But as he carried the suitcase into the dining room, Jared couldn't help thinking about their tiny apartment in New York and their family before the divorce. He wished this was some kind of gimmicky vacation not real life. Chapter two, in which two walls are explored by vastly different methods. And there's a picture, it says, the creek startled him into a jerking upright. And if you wanna keep continuing to find out what happens, come to the library to check out the field guide.